Debussy's been kicking my butt lately. Even like these relatively simple pieces like the arabesques. He wrote two arabesques um, that I played years ago uh, when I was in high school. It was really funny just starting to play it and I was like, man, this is not going as well as I would have hoped. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what happens when you leave it alone for more than 10 years. I'm not gonna say exactly how many. But here, I'll, I'll show you, check this out. I'm gonna play, this is like the first page of it. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and I apologize. Not exactly polished. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's to be expected, right? But just gotta keep working, I guess. Gotta keep working. In the interest of full disclosure, I actually recorded that yesterday, because so I was hoping to record more of it until I realized how rusty it is. <laughs> so today I'm back at the church. Um, I have a meeting here shortly, and I'm hoping to get some work done on another WC piece that I just started learning for the very first time. And it's tricky, but we'll see. I'll do what I can. So I wanted to talk today about uh, choosing the right music teacher for you. You know, not just any music teacher. Is it better if I... Man, hold on. But I wanted to talk today about choosing the right music teacher for you. And I think the first thing you really need to ask yourself is why you're taking lessons at all. Not at all, but I mean, why are you taking lessons? Um, are you taking lessons because you are thinking about majoring in music or having a career as a musician? Uh, by the way, those two, um, you can do one or the other. You don't have to do both. You can actually have a career in music without majoring in music, just like you can major in music without having a career in music. Um, is that what you're going for? Are you looking for enrichment? Are you doing this as a hobby? And rather than just random ads, though there's nothing wrong with that, um, get some recommendations. Ask friends and family. Um, it would not be a bad idea at all to get in touch with some of your local colleges, especially if you live near a conservatory, and inquire about teachers they would recommend, or if there are any uh, graduate students, for example, or potentially uh, undergraduate students or faculty that would be interested in teaching. Um, or if they have a list of recommended teachers. That could be super helpful, as well as your local music stores can also help you out with that, whether that's a, a family-owned place or a chain like Music and Arts or whatever the case might be. Uh, there can also be a good source if you're not sure where to go about finding a teacher. One of the other things that's really crucial with a private music teacher is personality and how they get along with you. It's kind of like you're going on a really long road trip you want to make sure it's a good fit with this person. Otherwise, it could be terrible if you're not careful about that, which is why I definitely suggest go for an interview. Go talk to them, ask them some questions, see if you can also set up a trial lesson um, so you can see what, it, what their teaching style is like, if it's uh, something that you can really learn from, and if there's somebody that you click with and can enjoy working with. That's super important. Part of that also is knowing yourself and some of the things that you might need. For example, if you know that you have a tendency to slack off a little bit, maybe you need a teacher who's going to push you, or if you have a tendency to be afraid of going outside your comfort zone, um, it's very helpful to know yourself some of your own tendencies uh, before you go in. And that's also part of the value of having that trial. During this interview process, make sure you're asking them the questions about their previous teaching experience, what their education was like. Also ask about things like the studio policy, right? What is the policy if they cancel a lesson or if you need to cancel a lesson? How much notice do you need to give? Um, how they do payments, you know? Some teachers are by month, by semester, by year, by lesson. So it's, it's all over the place. So those are good things to know. 
um, as well as the cancellations, especially if you're sick or if there's terrible weather or something like that. Also part of that interview should be the type of genres, because um, not all teachers can teach all genres. And in fact, most teachers cannot. And if they can, it's kind of a jack of all trades situation, right? So if you know you want to do classical, you really need a classical specialist. If you know you want to do jazz, you should really start with a jazz specialist, um, if possible. If that's not possible in your situation, it's okay. <laughs> it's better to get started um, with somebody who you get along well with and who has good experience and training uh, so they can help you. For example, I can teach some degree of jazz, but I'm not a jazz musician. Right? You don't want to come to me if you really, really, really want to do jazz. You just don't. I'm not the best choice for that. And that's okay. So know what genres they specialize in, what they're comfortable doing. And that can, you can also ask about what sort of teaching materials they use, right? What types of scores and what types of method books or scale books or whatever the case might be. Um, just get an idea of the kind of materials they use. I would also recommend during this time checking out their bio see what kind of credentials they have, right? Do they have their degrees in music? Have they had a career in music? Or are they, you know, somebody who's done it more as a hobbyist or as an amateur and they just also teach? Particularly if you are serious about wanting to study, this can be very important because as a beginner, these initial habits that you establish are going to form very strongly. And ideally, you'd like to have good habits from the beginning, not bad habits that you're going to have to spend a very long time uh, getting rid of because they can, some of them are just frankly unhealthy uh, and, and others will actually stop your progress. And so, especially in the early stages, I mean, it always pays off to go for the best teacher you can find in terms of qualifications and in how well you get along with them. But Early on, those initial habits can really be crucial. I started off self-taught, and so I still struggle with certain bad habits that I initially had as a beginner, even though I had uh, several years of lessons and you know two degrees in piano. If I'm not cognizant of it, they can still creep in there. Or if I'm not being very conscious of it, I guess, uh, they can sneak in there. So check that out, see what their biography's like, see what their education's like, and that can make a really big difference in conjunction with everything else. This is the Debussy piece that's completely new to me that I started learning. Um, it's actually one of my favorites ever since I was in high school, but I've just never played it, and it's obviously rather tricky. If you've never heard it, um, it's beautiful, it's exciting, it's joyous, as the title would obviously suggest. Um, but it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. <laughs> and then there's the end of the piece. So I'm going to get started on this. I've spent maybe 10 minutes practicing it total so far, so this is going to be bad. <laughs> starts off with this trill. That's all I got. <laughs> so it's supposed to be quiet and crescendo until you get to this, which is supposed to be way faster. Well, at least most people play it way faster. <laughs> but I can't play it that fast yet. Kind of a cool chromatic line, kind of highlighting the tritone there, dividing the octave all symmetrically. That's the one that I'm, I think I'm weak on right now. Do you hear that? How when I played it just then, it was it wasn't speaking right. Yeah, like that. My third finger is not getting that C-sharp right. Ah.
<laughs> yeah, so all kinds of mess. It needs way more slow practice. Um, I'm not going to film that because I don't want to bore you to death. But yeah, that's my butchering of the opening of this piece. Um, it's good. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be better uh, sooner rather than later. I'll do some work on it and keep you guys updated as the piece starts to progress. Meeting is ever closer. Let's see if it improved at all in those couple of minutes or however long that was. I don't like that, starting off with like an accent. on the next page has some really cool moments like this part right here where this little melody is kind of leading in before they change back to bass clef I'm like this is just really if you play it well <laughs> which I can't yet um, this part's just really like such a beautiful sonority and then this little thing and then it comes back and then this I'll try to play it um, I'll take it easy Closer to tempo would be like, oh, no, not those notes though. So it's got kind of a thing. You hear that? hand crossing nightmare because you have the two against three polyrhythm with the hand crossing it's great that's not a good fingering but oh well anyway hopefully even though i'm playing it terribly um that can give you an idea of just some of the really beautiful things in this piece go check it out if you have not heard it before. if you need the title before i leave this piece alone this particular passage right here um, in the right hand is one of those where there are several fingerings I've looked at, um, or I guess not looked at, but experimented with. Um, I haven't really decided which one I want to go with, but there's one that's really makes your thumb very central, which kind of reminds me of something Busoni talked about. I don't remember if it was in his Essence of Music book or in an interview or in uh, one of the other like in his uh, Klavierbung, the keyboard studies book, where he kind of tr treats the thumb almost as like the center portion of the hand. Just something to experiment with.